This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're starting off on the 10 o'clock block here on a Wednesday, Energy Wednesday, I like to say. And uh, where is energy on Maui and Molokai? So we had a trip there uh, last Thursday, uh, uh, courtesy of Fred Riddell. He is the um, commissioner of energy for Maui County. And uh, we got to see a number of things and uh, wanted to catch up with him and see if we could, uh, you know, sort of make uh, analysis and figure out what it all means. So welcome to the show by Skype, Fred Riddell. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank you. Great to be on. So uh, yeah, let's well, let's review first what we did. You, you set up the uh, itinerary. It was wonderful to see all the things in Maui and then in Molokai that um, uh, that that relate to the question of how energy renewables, especially how they're doing uh, in Maui County. So uh, can you take us through the itinerary and uh, remind me? <laughs> I was so tired totally. when we got back, I couldn't remember. Remind me of what we did last Thursday. Right. Well, we started with Krispy Kreme donuts. Of course. But uh, yeah. after that. Um, we did go over to the Wahi Wind Farm uh, owned by Sempra and uh, took a look at those operations, interviewed the uh, gentleman there uh, that uh, told us a little bit about you know how it operates, what they're doing. We learned a little bit about their environmental mitigation even um, and some of the things that they do there, uh, which I think uh, you know is, is one big part of, of uh, renewable energy on Maui. There's plenty of uh, wind resources that are currently being used. Um, and then uh, uh, from there, we, we went over and toured at uh, Maui Tropical Plantation. We toured with Pacific Biodiesel and, and Bob King, uh, looking at one of their uh, new um, crops of sunflowers and to learn a little bit about what they're doing and what their vision is, uh, both from um, you know an agricultural standpoint, a sustainable ag agricultural standpoint, and how does that link into energy and perhaps using that to uh, produce fuel and uh, learned a little more there. I saw them in the PBN this morning. Uh, they, they concluded an extension contract supplying Hawaiian Electric with biofuel. That's really a, a feather in their cap. They're, they're oh, sustainable as, as, a, as a provider of biofuel. And in fact, uh, the, the peaking plant in Kapolei uses their fuel, a big tank of their fuel. So we really have local sustainability in the state over biofuel. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's an interesting uh, product. It's um, you know, if you're uh, if you need liquid fuels or even gas fuels, because the county itself is looking at uh, uh, digester projects to produce um, a renewable methane gas. Um, you know, if you're you could import it, or you can get the same product or the same value product, uh, except for in a renewable form, uh, by growing that locally. And uh, so, so making some of those decisions are some important ones. And I thought that that would be some useful things to um, learn about on what's going on in Maui. Then from there, of course, the um, uh, we wanted to understand what the Maui Electric is doing. And so we went to the control room there, which I, I really kind of like. It looked like my old submarine days, you know, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, things and blinking lights and knobs and such, which is just wonderful. You know, uh, control no room, sophisticated. control room, right? It's all the same nomenclature, control room, control room. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, control room, control room. Yeah, so luckily they don't have a con. So, you know, otherwise they'll start driving the islands around. But um, so the, uh, it took, but to really learn a little bit about, you know, how does that work? And it's really, it's complex right now, uh, for sure. They're, they have a very, they have a changing system that uh, has different demands on it than it did before. And then other demands, like it's an aging infrastructure. And so, uh, and as we saw in Maui recently with a, um, a blackout for an extended period of time, one uh, a day a few uh, weeks ago, you know, it's Maui Electric that's still bringing the grid up and, and maintaining that resiliency that the islands need to keep the economy going, to keep people safe, to be able to provide services. And so they're they're the ones doing that day to, day in and day out. Um, and so it was really interesting to learn a little bit about that. So then we wanted, I thought it would be useful to head over to Molokai because um, there it's just a little bit different than uh, Maui. Um, it's smaller. Uh, it's uh, the control room, as you saw there, with, uh, for Miko is uh, uh, smaller too. It's uh, you know operated by one person. Uh, the uh, plant itself is uh, you know older, but you know supplying the grid you know as it needs to. But but the interesting thing there is that uh, Miko is looking to bring that island 
from an electricity standpoint to 100% renewable energy sooner than other islands which uh, there's many different things we could talk about on that, but some of the interesting ones are uh, that they had a battery project there that they have been working on to help support the frequency of the grid, which is different than just what everybody thinks about a battery is that I'm going to shift energy. Here, this high technology thing is trying to actually keep the frequency stabilized on the grid, which is another interesting thing we're able to go. Ooh. Yeah, 60 Hertz. Can you talk about what that means and how you maintain it? Sure, sure. Uh, well, it's, it's you know uh, alternating current. Uh, this is uh, how most of our grid is. Although like photovoltaic panels and such are in direct current DC, uh, they all when they go back into the uh, hot home or, or supplying our to our outlets are converted through in that case an inverter back to pr produce alternating current. That current that uh, uh, alternating current is operating at 60 hertz. It's how many cycles per second. Uh, that the voltage fluctuates. Um, and so the um, uh, that's what you're trying to maintain and a very reliable grid would have that frequency holding very close to 60 Hertz at all times. Uh, it was traditionally maintained on the grid by having high inertia, big rotating steel um, you know, machinery but as we've transitioned in time to having less of those things operating or at operating at lower megawatts, they're not providing as much of that inertia on the grid that previously was there. And now you're not getting a lot of that currently from the photovoltaics. Uh, the technology that was used for a lot of those doesn't support that, although that part of the technology is also changing. Mm -hmm. um, so that grid needs something like this battery there that uh, what it does is it's a very small battery, but has a very high power level. So if you're looking at a battery that has sort of these two components, how much power can deliver at any moment, and how much energy it can deliver over a period of time. And so for uh, for this one, it was a, I think it's a, if I recall correctly, a two megawatt battery, but only about an eight for 18 minutes. Um, and so what that's doing on a grid that's actually at a peak of about three to five megawatts is it's really becoming the, the big dog in the system and able to move the frequency or hold the frequency very steady, mm -hmm. which is a very innovative project. Mm -hmm. The um, other things that I understand, I believe we spoke there of, uh, is that they're looking at installing a load bank for the grid there too, where they want to be able to have over frequency protection, where if you didn't have this, you could imagine that the frequency goes very high and perhaps damages some of the equipment in your home or something like that. So, so those sort of new technologies are going to be needed on the grid as we transform it to 100% renewable energy. Yeah, and I noticed in both control rooms we saw, both in Maui and in Molokai, there was a big readout. I guess it's all about big readouts in the middle of all these monitors and readouts, a uh, big readout for the Hertz. And uh, I remember particularly in Maui, it was, you know, it was, um, it was changing from 59.9 uh, to 60.1 and back to 60 again. So is, the Hawaiian Electric is looking, is monitoring this all the time to make sure it's within tolerable limits. The same thing actually in Molokai. So I guess yeah. this, is, this is, I wasn't aware of the need to do that. And uh, now clearly um, there is a need obviously, and they're monitoring it. And, and now they have these batteries in Molokai that can, I was very, I was very impressed with uh, the, the, the quality of that station, even though it was diesel, it seemed very compact and efficient and it had this new battery equipment. So all of that was a, a very interesting tour of the Molokai uh, control room. Yes, absolutely. It was a, uh, it's a very interesting plant to, uh, to look at. And you're right, they're, they're continually looking at frequency. They're at every moment balancing the amount of power on the grid. So um, every moment that uh, a cloud goes over a photovoltaic plant or over some homes and that one's not generating as, it, as much as it was at some moment, or somebody plugs in a large load, like now electric vehicles coming on the grid, those are becoming larger and larger loads depending on the charging system. You, um, they, they have to continually adjust the amount of power that's getting injected or not injected into the grid uh, to balance it at every moment. All the electrons either, you know, get consumed, you know, that were generated, you know, in every minute. Yeah, so that's, all this um, new, new that's really what they're doing is maintaining that frequency 
and that power. And then the voltage, of course, is is going to be um, you know the, another new or another key component as we start to look at two-way power flows on the grid. And if people start generating from what used to be um, distributed down out to the house, they generate power back from that direction, the voltage on the grid is going to be different everywhere. And those are gonna be new opportunities. And that's really the interesting thing is, is that Hawaii has all of these opportunities coming uh, to learn, uh, to actually come up with new solutions uh, that could be exported out of Hawaii uh, and, and really do Hawaii well. And so setting a 100% renewable energy goal is giving this opportunity that the rest of the world could actually use. Yeah, and I think uh, it's, it's worthy to note that this, that, you know, that the technology that allows us to work the grid this way, to bring all the elements of the grid together in an efficient way, um, it's part of the march toward renewables. We need to do this. And the comforting point of, of the trip uh, was that we are doing this. We are using new technologies to balance the load and otherwise um, become more efficient in, in doing that two-way two -way directional on the energy you mentioned. I'd like to ask you one, one thing, though, Fred, before we take our break, and is the Half Moon Project is going to change things in Molokai. Uh, can you just give us the specs on that? Um, I don't know the exact size. I think that that's still uh, in discussions uh, between uh, Miko and that vendor, and I believe that they have a uh, non-disclosure agreement. So all of the information about it isn't that public at the moment, but I understand that they are looking at doing a, a large-scale battery and uh, photovoltaic project near the power generating station um, to deliver a good portion of the energy throughout the entire day and into the evening uh, with the batteries. And so that that definitely will be, you know, if it moves forward, um, you know, another interesting aspect for that island. And it's similar to what uh, uh, was being done on Kauai with uh, the Tesla project first and now an AES project. Both of those will have uh, have similar characteristics. Uh, and it's a, a, a interesting move forward uh, for the utilities. I, I, I believe that some of the um, solicitations that they may um, uh, move forward with now will include concepts like that to provide something that's more firm or just as firm as you need it to be. We don't always need uh, 24 hour availability of every single unit, but uh, we do need firm and flexible uh, renewable energy so that th that can be delivered in, in many hours, not just at the moment that the sun is shining. Yeah, I see it as a march forward. Anyway, we marched all around Maui, uh, Maui County, uh, with uh, Chris Reynolds, uh, uh, who is from, um, uh, what, Maui Electric, and uh, uh, Todd Kanja, who is from Hawaii, uh, uh, Hawaiian Electric here in Honolulu, um, to have this great tour with Fred Riddell last Thursday. Learned a lot, <clears throat> and uh, you know, to me, one of the basic principles that I learned uh, was the need to, need to take this technology, step forward with it, and, and it's necessary to do that uh, on the road to renewables, and Hawaii is actually on the road to renewables, and, and it's comforting to know that this is happening in Maui and also Molokai. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back, and we'll see if we can look at this from the 50,000-foot level and uh, see the statewide landscape and try to get a handle on where Maui County is in the statewide landscape and energy. We'll be right back with Fred Riddell. This is ThinkTech Hawaii, raising public awareness. This is ThinkTech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Greetings, it's me, Angus McTech, the longtime host and star of Hibachi Talk. ThinkTech is important to our community because we bring all kinds of cool ideas and I bring gadgets to the, to the show. So you gotta watch it for sure. But for the first time, ThinkTech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to ThinkTech. We'll run only during the month of November and you can help. Please donate what you can that ThinkTech in Hawaii can continue to be public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine, and I'm in charge. I've already made my donation, and it's really hard to get discussed when they make a donation, but I already did. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, thanks for thinktech.cosbox.com. Say that three times fast. Closing, on behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech, Hawaii's 30 plus, Weekly shows, thank you, and we're mahalo for watching ThinkTech and your generosity. Let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! All 
Okay, we're back, we're back, we're live with Fred Riddell, who uh, was uh, the guy who organized this great tour we had of uh, Maui uh, and uh, Molokai last Thursday. Fred is the energy commissioner for Maui County, and of course that covers uh, Molokai. So uh, let's, let's try to look at this from you know, the larger perspective, Fred. Um, you know, we visited a number of installations, and if you connect the dots, it start, starts to give you an idea about how Maui is doing and how Molokai is doing as against the larger landscape of renewables and the march to renewables in the state. So where would you say Maui County, including Molokai, is or are, um, you know, uh, as, a, as compared with other islands and, and the, uh, you know, the target, the goals of the state in general? Sure. Well, I mean, there's many areas to look at um, from an electrical generation standpoint and from the RPS, which is, uh, relates to sales by the utility. Um, you know, Maui County is, is about you know, average in that field. I believe the Big Island is uh, uh, ahead on that and producing more renewable energy. The, um, uh, in other areas, you know, where we're really trying to look for is, is changing the economy in general, right? Uh, it's not, not having such a reliance on fossil fuel. And that, that big portion of that actually is in the transportation sector. And, and this is where Maui is actually a little ahead of the other islands, you know, with the Jump Smart Maui program that uh, happened with, mm -hmm. uh, with the Japanese government, government and uh, Hitachi. Yeah. That brought a lot of electric vehicles onto the island, which is now an opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for uh, for the county to continue moving those those ideas forward. So so you know I think uh, we're we're all working towards the same goal. Yeah, I coordinate with the other counties. We come up with other ideas, and at the moment we're all going to uh, get together at the end of uh, November to work on our uh, climate adaptation plan and uh, see where we should go, what practices we should do, and make sure that we're all looking at it in the same way. So it's it's perfectly clear. Um, yeah, that, I think that's great. I, I think it's great that you're having that program. Uh, and um, it's, it's an opportunity not only to discuss uh, climate and uh, sustainability vis-a-vis -vis cli climate, but also to compare notes on what, what each of the islands is doing, which each of the utility facilities is doing on those islands so that you can learn from each other and raise all the boats pretty much hopefully at the same time. So how, how, will, that, how will that play? I mean, who will be there and will they have opportunity for that discussion? And what discussion do you contemplate? Well, I, um, I I'd have to pull up the agenda at the moment. <laughs> Not very prepared for that question, but all of the counties will be there and so many of the stakeholders throughout, throughout uh, Hawaii will also be there and it'll be facilitated. Uh, and what we're trying to get to are some goals of defining our climate action plan to come up with what are the things that we're doing uh, with respect to the state's commitment to uh, uh, portions of the climate of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement, and um, you know how are we all moving in that direction? How are we uh, uh, counting our the the carbon impact of our operations? How, you know what are we doing to move transportation forward uh, to give opportunity in transportation for clean transportation? What are we doing in energy? Uh, what are we doing? from a, a standpoint of um, uh, resiliency around the islands, you know, uh, how do we do planning in the future for roads? Also, it, it should cover the spectrum. That's great, and, and ThinkTech will be there, or we'll try to be there anyway, bring our cameras and see what's going on with all yes. the counties getting together that way, because I think this is so important. So uh, anyway, I, I want to talk about public opinion for a minute, you know? We've seen um, resistance to uh, you know, certain kinds of progress. We've seen resistance to wind sometimes. That's not the case in Oahu, though. Uh, in Oahu um, and, and Ulupalakua, Maui, uh, the local people who live in the towns around uh, the ranch there uh, are pretty happy about the wind facility. They support it, which is good. But how would you characterize the, uh, you know, the public opinion in, say, Maui? I'll get to Molokai in a minute. Um, do they support renewables? Are they behind it? Are they excited about it? Do they believe uh, in the goal that will meet the goal? Uh, what sort of feedback do you get when you go out into the crowd? I think I um, invariably I get support for the renewable energy goals. I think the um, the community is on board with that. I think everybody realizes that we are are um, you know at risk of that supply chain, uh, the, the fuel supply chain that comes to the islands, whether it's a disruption in that uh, because of a natural disaster or a geopolitical event, or um, the escalation or fluctuation of prices that we 
we need to figure out how to hedge properly against. And, and so maybe uh, everybody sees, you know, renewable energy as a hedge for that fuel price in the future. Um, I think that, that, you know, that's where people really get on board with it. And, um, you know, from the idea that we're doing something that we don't have to pollute, in many cases now we're seeing where renewable energy is cheaper, not just giving you a hedge, but cheaper than the alternative or the conventional fossil fuel burning. And so technology is allowing that and people I, I believe are embracing it, absolutely. Yeah, um, well, that's great to hear because, uh, you know, of course you have to have public support to do this. And, and if, if there emerges activist groups that want to oppose projects, it's troublesome and it, it does uh, tend to delay things. So then we fly off to Molokai right? and I didn't know what to expect in Molokai. Um, because Molokai you know, has resisted change, resisted outside influences in many ways over the past couple of decades, really. Um, and uh, it seemed to me, and I was, I was expecting that we'd see that resistance. And maybe to some extent we saw that. We, we interviewed uh, uh, Amelia from uh, Molokai, Sustainable Molokai. Um, and I got the name right. And she, and she was the one who is trying to negotiate some kind of deal with... Uh, Half Moon, which is trying to do that uh, solar battery uh, project that I mentioned. Um, so, I mean, how would you how would you characterize the mood, if you will, the public opinion, um, her constituents uh, in Molokai? Are they in favor of renewables? Uh, are they, is the jury out? Uh, are they resisting? What, what what is it like there now? Well, I think um, uh, for Molokai, I, you know, I, I probably can give you the. You know, I don't have a lot of history there, of course, you know, uh, but about a year and a half ago when I first started this position in that first week, I went over to Molokai. And um, uh, this just sort of to set the framework for what I see uh, as for Molokai. And, and um, you know, a lot of people, you know, uh, that have money or have opportunity, um, you know, want to push a certain, you know, agenda. And uh, Molokai, I saw that there are there is a lot of grid defection, but I saw it in a different way, where people can't pay their bills. You know, that's that's a, just a different form of grid defection. That uh, you know, we need to make sure that we pay attention to in this move forward. And so there are, there are many people on Molokai that uh, you know need to make sure that when we evolve the grid and we're trying to make a um, uh, a cleaner future and a more resilient future that we're also doing it in a way that isn't extremely expensive. So, so some of the resistance that I've seen in Molokai definitely is never about doing something locally, that's for sure. And I think that's wonderful. Um, it, but it's, it's definitely about the, the wanting to manage that risk and, and wanting to make sure that if their community is taking a risk, that, uh, that they're also seeing that benefit. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, so whether it's w with Amelia or with others on Molokai, there's many different groups on Molokai that uh, uh, speak for their constituencies individually. They, um, they all uh, uh, sort of have that same feel that, that they definitely want to be a part of their future um, and make sure that, that, you know, local really does mean local. Yeah, and you, you know, that's it's constructive in general, uh, our conversation with her. But, demonstrated a pretty constructive approach uh, by her and her organization, Sustainable Molokai. Can we skip uh, to, um, to the Big Island now? The Big Island, you know, had all kinds of troubles about geothermal back when, uh, back in the 90s, and oh, there was lawsuits and whatnot. Now it's kind of a, it's gla it's a glass ceiling on the amount of geothermal that uh, a Pune a Geothermal Venture can produce. But the fact is that there are more renewables on the grid in uh, in the Big Island than in the other islands, as, as I understand it, what what's the public opinion like there, uh, to the extent you know about it? Um, well, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with the public opinion there, but when I do coordinate some with the uh, you know the county my county counterparts there, uh, they all are moving you know in the same direction. Um, similarly to uh, Kauai, um, with respect to say ge geothermal, as you're mentioning, I think the um, you know uh, that aspect. It's just another resource that could come to the grid, and, it, and if it meets the need, and uh, if it's environmentally acceptable, that uh, you know it could be a, it could be a good resource. And you know, so that you know, the Big Island has more of that potential, I believe, from what I've seen in in like NREL mapping and uh, studies 
there, are, there is some of that value on, on Maui. I'm not sure that that would be what would necessarily bring us faster to 100% renewable or cheaper. You know, what I really want to see in what, however we deploy things is that it's, you know, uh, reliable, you know, at the right price, you know, and at the right time. Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, Hawaii, the big island is definitely uh, um, blazing that trail. What about Kauai? What's your, what's your take on Kauai? I mean, KIUC has been pretty effective in managing the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the discussion, the conversation among its members. And maybe that's an interesting point about uh, co-ops, that uh, its members are closer, you know, perhaps, than ordinary ratepayers because they get to vote on exactly who's, who's on the board and so forth. But what's your take on their success and um, you know, the, the, the quality of their uh, implementation in, in Kauai? I, I um, being a former developer, I definitely like to see the uh, the projects that are coming online there. These solar and battery projects, um, you know, looking at what you know for KIUC to look at what is their need to define that need and then to solicit for someone to fill that, I think is a, a very healthy process. Mm -hmm. um, and that they have independent power producers doing those projects, taking on that risk. Um, and accepting that risk and then delivering reliable power makes a lot of sense. And they they uh, have these projects that are, are very low cost. They have a, a significant amount of energy storage and they're doing that, that, that price, these independent power producers on a remote island in Hawaii, mm -hmm. which is just for, for me to see is, is phenomenal. And I think it's great that they are ahead of the game there because uh, with that sort of contracting because they're also able to take advantage of the investment tax credits at a higher rate before they start to phase down, which is such an important part for Hawaii. We all pay federal tax and we want to get some of that benefit. But if we have a roadblock or, or some obstacle that isn't allowing us to get that investment in our community and get our share out of that investment tax credit, you know, we're, we're um, you know, not getting the best service out of our utility. So I think now that they are moving forward, uh, at least on Maui and, and their other islands, it's good to see. I hope that those can all be uh, sorted out, contracted and closed in time so that we get that you know value of that investment tax credit. It's great to be able to talk to you, Fred. Fred Riddell, the energy commissioner for the county of Maui. And it's great to, to see the counties um, you know, talking to each other and collaborating and uh, the state moving ahead as one, which I, I really love to see. I only have one last question for you. What's the plan, if you can talk about it, on Maui? Uh, what makes Maui special? Uh, what is the special sauce you're moving ahead with as the energy commissioner for Maui County? Sure. Well, I think uh, everybody does know the um, larger utility plan. I think that that's a, a, you know, an exciting part that um, is uh, you know, moving forward. They do have plans for new projects, uh, solicitations for new generation. Um, into 2022, we'll have uh, by then the Kahului uh, power plant retired and we'll be bringing on new generation uh, to fill that need. But uh, beyond that, the county, of course, is looking at you know its operations and is trying to figure out how do we continue also being more renewable, how do we reduce our carbon impact? And, and so we have uh, contracted for digester projects to actually uh, make renewable energy at some of our facilities, to use some of that energy to deal with our problems of uh, sludge for our waste disposal, trying to come up with ways to uh, uh, reduce impacts into the landfill. So, so in a more complete way, beyond just the electric utility, you know, what the plan is for Maui is a bit of the all of the above. We need to find solutions in all areas and then see where those synergies exist. It's great to thinking about that. It's uh, it's great to to have this kind of awareness and uh, you know consciousness about the plan and the future of the plan and how it relates to other elements of our environment. Uh, so Fred, uh, thank you again for the trip last Thursday, and I look forward to uh, seeing you uh, if not sooner than at the uh, sustainability conference by the counties. Uh, later on this year. Thank you so much. Fred Riddell, Energy Commissioner of Maui. Aloha.